All right, welcome to Discovery Church. Let me look into this camera and welcome everyone who's joining us online and everyone outdoor in our Courtyard Overflow Amphitheater. Come on, will you welcome everybody to Discovery Church? Come on, make some noise if you're excited to be here. On that note, there's, uh, we're at again one of the uh, capacity uh, here in the worship center. If there are empty seats around you, maybe scoot in a little bit. There's a lot of people who are looking for seats that, that are either going to outdoor. Or some of them, they started driving away because it's too cold. I don't know. Make some room for some people. And we'll let them in as, they, as we see room that everyone's seated. Uh, there are a few more seats in here. I'm really excited about this series. We're beginning called Red Flags. Someone say red flags. red flags. Red flags. Yeah, this is a relationship series. Let me give you a definition of red flags here. Red flags are a signal of danger, a warning sign, a sign of potential disaster, or that there's problems that need to be addressed. Okay, so, so like in NASCAR, for those of you who are NASCAR fans, I don't watch NASCAR, but I know that they, they wave the red flag when there's um, uh, something wrong with the track. There's like danger on the track. You got a red flag. If you've ever gone to the beach, you see a red flag that's like there's something in the water, like there's danger in the water. It could be like undercurrent, a strong undercurrent can take you or your children out. Um, if they put two red flags on the beach, it's like you can't swim. There's no swimming at this time. Maybe there's some sharks in the water or something, but it's not safe. It's, it's a dangerous condition. It doesn't mean you can never get in the water again. It just means that the current condition, like at present, it's too dangerous, like it can cause harm and something needs to be addressed or something needs to be removed before you continue. So in this series, we're going to be looking at the red flags in our relationships. But I want to be clear that the red flags don't always mean you, you can't continue the relationship. It just means that there's something that needs to be addressed, not overlooked. That there's a potential danger in this relationship. And there is maybe some boundaries that need to be set in this. Instead of overlooking... We need to address some of the red flags in our relationships. So we're really talking about like in our, in our dating relationships, red flags in our marriage. Uh, today we're going to be talking about red flag friends. Don't look at them, don't elbow them or nothing like that. The scriptures, there's so many like, like biblical wisdom uh, in, the, in, in the Bible. There's so much wisdom about like heeding the warning signs, <laughs> the red flags around you. Here's one of them, Proverbs 27, verse 12. It says the prudent, some of your translations say the wise. The wise see danger and they take refuge. So they, they heed the warning sign. They saw the red flag and they kind of did something about it. They took re refuge. But the simple, some of your translations say foolish, the foolish or simple keep going and pay the penalty. I think we all need to ask ourselves, what am I paying for because I kept going? What, like, like there's, the, the signs were there. They were there. Maybe you didn't want to see them, but they were there. Maybe, you, you, I mean, someone even told you, they're like, that dude's no good. No, I'm just kidding. There's like, but you're, hey, that's not the right or this, and you just kept going anyway. And you even, a lot of times, we get a check in our spirit, don't you? There's some discernment. There's, there's a spiritual check inside of us, a Holy Spirit nudge that, that we disregard for whatever reason. In this series, I think what I hope to do is that to, to raise a little bit of this, the, the awareness of maybe some of the red flags that you've been overlooking. What I don't want to do, though, is to get all finger pointing up in this area, like, like, like cutting relationships off and judging people. Be careful. Like in a series like this, it can be really easy just to be thinking about everyone else, not thinking about you. Let God reveal the red flags in your life, okay? Like, what's this, what are the red flags inside of me, man? As we look at these red flag friends, don't be judging all your friends. Kind of examine yourself here and say, man, am I a good friend? Are there any of these flags inside of my heart? Red flag friends. Today is Small Group Sunday. We're so excited. We got over 100 small groups for you to choose from. And my hope and prayer is that for everybody who calls Discovery Church home would find a place of community in a group, man. And there's is, there is so many of them. I'll be honest with you. There's like, there's like different curriculum you can choose, but I don't even care about the curriculum at all. Like I want it to be biblical and doctrinal, you know what I mean? But I don't care. I just want you, I'm, I have a hidden agenda. I'll be honest with you. I just want you connected to healthy people. That's it. I just want you connected to some healthy people in your life, you guys, it's so important. Let me give you two key, two key truths you need to know as we kind of get started on this journey. 
today talking about red flag friends. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's a lot of people who think that they're spiritually mature because of how long they've gone to church. Uh, like how much you've read, how much you know, or, or maybe how much content you consume. You might, some of you even brag about it. Oh, how many sermons? Like I listen to this many on YouTube, and I, and I got this, and I subscribe. And you, got, you brag about how much you've read and how much you've consumed. Please write this down. Content consumption is no substitute for community. Content consumption is no substitute for community. You have never heard a story of transformation that did not involve other people. You know why? Because nobody fixes themselves by themselves. We all need other people. Like, like to be honest with you, it's not even gonna happen in here where you guys are all facing forward. That's not gonna happen. Life change happens face to face, not facing forward. So don't get me wrong, like, like something can start in here, spark in here, catalyze in here. Like I can give you stuff to think about. I can, I, can, I can give you some insight in the word of God that maybe you didn't see before. I can even declare the prophetic word of God into your life. But when we talk about transformation, that cannot happen unless you're in community. Unless you're in community. Some of you, you have faith. You love God. You have faith. You believe and you're still struggling. So maybe, maybe the problem isn't you need more faith. Maybe the problem is you need more real friends, the right friends in your life. Maybe you got some red flag friends. Okay, I got, I had 25 red flags I was gonna give you guys. <laughs> but I decided not to, I'm actually gonna go over a lot more red flags. I'm gonna give you a bunch of red flags in this series. In today's message, though, I'm just going to give you seven red flags in your friendship, some warning signs, remember, like, whoa, wait, this is a potential danger. Something needs to be addressed. And that's because I really wanted to. The last flag I'm going to give you, I'm going to teach it. I'm just going to dig in a little bit because I think we need to, to grow, especially as we get connected to groups and stuff. That's, what, that's the last, last flag is what we really need to learn, okay? Y'all ready for this? Y'all ready to grow in this series, man? Get some wisdom, Okay. Here's, here's the first flag, and this kind of speaks to if you're a follower of Jesus, mostly, uh, if you're a Christian in the house. But number one is this. Friends, this is a red flag, if you've got a friend who expresses hate for another believer, man, some alarms should be going off inside of your spirit. If another follower of Jesus is expressing like vehement, some hate, some disgust over another follower of Christ, here's why the alarms need to go off. It's not in your notes, but write it down somewhere. First John chapter four, verse 20 says this, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. There is some really strong deception going on in someone's life who would buy into a lie of the devil to cause them to hate another follower of Jesus who was created in the image of God, who God has redeemed with his blood and hate them. That's, that's a red flag better be going off. Number two, friends that gossip to you about their other friends. <laughs> Now look, when you decide, if you decide to cut gossip out of your life, what you're going to realize is that there are some friendships you have that have no real substance. That your relationship is based upon talking about other people. And in, in many cases, if they gossip to you, they're going to gossip about you. This is a major red flag, especially if the individual feels so comfortable gossiping about others as soon as they meet you. Like as soon as they meet you, the, love, the way that they connect with you is by talking about other people's lives, problems, or issues. Red flag. Red flag. I'm not saying like, I, like it can never happen. I'm just saying that there's something wrong with that racetrack and you better address some things before you continue driving. Okay? Number three. I'm not going to get a lot of amens with this one, I know, because it's red flags. You don't want to hurt the people next to you and stuff like that. But I get it. It's good stuff. Number three. Friends that refuse to apologize. This is a major sign of not just like a red flag, but this is a major sign of a toxic person in your life. If anyone, whether they're a friend, they are your partner, they are a relative, an individual who cannot admit their faults, listen to me, cannot offer a healthy relationship. They are not ready nor able to have a healthy, sustained relationship if they cannot apologize and, 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 
and admit their own faults. That is a major red flag. The water is not, sharks are in the water, okay, guys? Don't swim, don't swim. Number four, the relationships are marked by conflict. All of their relationships, like, man, they just, uh, like I say, they have problems with everybody. I mean, they, 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 they you know, they've, they got drama following them everywhere. I mean, they, every church they left, it was because, you know, the 10 churches were because of everyone else. And every, every friend they had, it's, it's, it's always, it's always, it's always, it's just a matter of time before you're a part of their story. All right, here's the next one. I think this is five. Friends who are jealous or view, view, view you as competition. Now, now again, it's just a red flag. I'm not saying that it never can continue, but if you got a friend who doesn't celebrate you, if you got a friend who, who feels threatened by your success, it's kind of hard to detect sometimes. I mean, it, them not celebrating you or them always trying to one-up you are trying to do the same things, take the same classes, get the same degree. Like, like they're trying to, they're trying to like, oh, wait, like you do this, and they, they're going to try to do it. And, and it's just, come on, just some discernment. You know you've already got, I'm saying these things and some red flags are going off in your spirit. I know they are, okay? That's just, that's, that's discernment. I'm not saying cut them off, not all the time, but I'm saying something needs to be addressed, right? Okay, here's number six. Red flag, you feel worse, not better after spending time with them. It's a red flag. Like, I just don't feel, I feel yucky. You know what I mean? I feel, and I'm not talking about introverts in here. Like, you're like, you know, like everyone you spend time with, you're like, you always feel drained, okay? I'm not talking about that natural introversion thing. Like, your friends are supposed to bring out the best in you. Not the word. You're not supposed to feel like emotionally drained and, and gross after being with, with your friends, okay? That's just a red flag. Like, they're not bringing the best out of me. They're kind of which, which leads to this last one, number seven, which I want to kind of teach today. And that is, uh, it's a red flag. If you've got some friends who don't build you up, they're pulling you down. If you've got friends that are pulling you down, like they're pulling you away from your identity in Christ, your purpose in Christ. They're pulling you away from God's will for your life. Uh, if you've got those friends that are pulling you in the opposite direction, Bro, my sister, that is a red flag. I'm not saying you can't have friends that are, that are like, don't believe what you believe. Please, Jesus had people that were like he was like connected to, that, that, but they weren't part of his inner circle. Stop that. Don't you use that excuse about, well, Jesus had, shut up. No, he did not have inner circle friends that did not have the same value system as him. He did not. Now, he, was he loving and kind and affectionate, like all that stuff to everybody? Yes, he was. But these are just some red flags that if you got people pulling you down instead of building you up, that's a red flag. And this is why small groups exist here at Discovery, to build you up. And that's what I want to teach you today, how to build each other up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11 says, encourage each other and build each other up. You know, it's just not my job to build you up, okay? That's the pastor's job. He preached and build me up, make me feel better. Come in everywhere. Give me my shot of motivation, pastor. Give me my steroid right here. Give me, pastor. <laughs> steroid it up, and I'm good for another week. I'll be back for another one. No, I'm not, like, we're called to encourage one another in Christ. And thank God it ain't all upon me, amen? A, it is, I, I thank God it's not all upon me. We've got many people who are leading, encouraging, and we, I am going to invite you to take a big step today to get connected to, to a group. We actually built in this service some extra time for you before you pick up your kids and go to your car for you to actually go uh, walk around and look at some, some groups. And I want to invite you not just to, to go to the group, but to be a part of building each other up. Not only that, you could be built up, but you could build other people up as well. So how do we do that? Let me give you four ways, very practical today. How can we build each other up? This is what groups do. This is what I'm inviting you to do. Number one, we can build each other up by affirming each other's worth. We affirm each other's worth. Here's a little secret if you haven't figured this out already. Everybody's looking for affirmation. Everybody needs affirmation. And people look for it and, and do things to be affirmed. They do the craziest things to be affirmed. They'll go out of their way and make the create like mistakes and just to be affirmed by people. If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about, man. What they, sometimes they do things just because they needed to be affirm but here's the question today like how how do i do this how do i affirm people in my life let me give you a few ways number one through acceptance 
through acceptance. This is a beautiful thing, not just about discovery, that you're going to be accepted here, no matter, what you're, no matter what you're coming in with and what your background is and what you've done or not done. Like, you're going to be accepted here. At groups, that's what happens. You're not going to get, like, snubbed out. You're not going to get a nose lifted up. You're going to get accepted. This is what the scriptures tell us to do. Romans 15 and 7 says, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. Now, he didn't put any conditions on it. He accepted us just as we are. Now, one of the main reasons that we, have, we don't accept other people is because we have this tendency to put our or project our strengths onto other people, forgetting that everyone has weaknesses, including us. It's just not always the same weakness. We all have different, but what happens is I project my strength on someone else and I judge you according to my strength. Like, you should, that should, you should, you should, like for instance, let me give you an example. Some of you are always on time. You think it's very important to be on time. You're an on-time kind of person. That's the way you were raised, you're on time. So you come to church and you're, you're on time. You even sit in, you, and you sit in the stadium in the back so that when people come in late, you can see them. You see them. And guess what? When they come in and they're late with their Starbucks coffee, you think to yourself, you, you think a little bit better about yourself. Yeah. Look at them coming in late. Okay. Or, or for some of you, you're a very clean, tidy person. You keep your house all nice and clean and tidy and very important to you. It's a value to you. You know what? It's a strength to you. It's great. You're, you do a good job at keeping everybody in the clean. And, and so when you go to other people's houses and stuff like that, you look around, you're like, uh-huh. I mean, you don't tell them you're inspecting their cleanliness and stuff, but you sure are looking, and inside, you're feeling really good about yourself. You're feeling really good that you're so much clean, cleaner. You got a nicer house. You upkeep it better. And so, so we, we, we feel better about ourselves by comparing our strengths to other people's weaknesses, and it's causing you to not only compare but not accept others. I, I, there is, there, let me tell you a better way to feel better about yourself. Instead of comparing yourself, instead of putting other people down, one of the greatest ways you can feel better about yourself is by lifting other people up. I mean, this is like this. There's no greater joy of lifting somebody else up. In fact, it's not God who's putting you down. You know that, right? God does not accuse you. In the Bible, you know who's called the accuser of the brethren? It's Satan, the enemy. It's called the accuser of the brethren. You know what that means? It means every time that you're, you're comparing and, and putting people down and you're accusing them, you're doing the devil's job. So, so you're not putting, when you're, when you're putting people down and comparing and stuff, you're not putting a smile on the heart of your father. You're putting a smile on Satan. That was probably too far, huh? Oh, well. <laughs> but it's the truth. You're doing his job. He's like, well, I can go on to the next one then. I got, they're doing a good job with that one. You know how you tell if you've accepted one, someone? Here's, here's the test. You stop insisting that they be just like you. That's how you know you've accepted someone. That, that's how you, you affirm each other's worth by acceptance. Here's the second way. With attention. Write that down with attention, because not just acceptance, because it takes more, more time, attention does, than acceptance. You can accept somebody and, and still ignore them, right? Like, I accept you, you just stay out of my life. <laughs> just, amen, you just stay over there, though. So you disregard people, you overlook them. Galatians 6.10 says, when we have the opportunity to help anyone, we should do it but we should give special attention. Look at what he says, special attention to those who are in the family of believers. Why is that? Why do they get special attention? It's one of the benefits of being in the family of God. It's one of the benefits of being a part of a healthy church is you get special, like, like why give special attention? Here's the principle that, that, that the, the author here is making. Whatever you give special attention to is gonna grow. Whatever you give more attention to in your life, it's gonna grow. It's one of the reasons why you have the wrong things growing in your life is because you're giving your attention to the wrong things. So, so if you want, if you want your, your kid to, your, like, to grow, if I want my garden to grow, give attention to the garden. If you want your work to grow, give attention to your work. If you want your kids to grow, give attention. If you want your marriage to grow, start giving your marriage attention and it'll grow. But we have all this distraction and we're giving our time to things that don't matter more. Well, the way that we can build each other up and affirm worth is by giving not just affection, but attention. 
Here's the number, number three. He's actually with affection. With affection. I'm talking about a, a physical touch here. All right? You probably read about babies with failure to thrive syndrome. You ever, you ever heard about that? Failure to thrive? It's, it's we, were designed by, we were designed, created by God this way, that, that an infant needs physical touch, skin-to-skin contact. And if they don't have enough physical touch, like if they are isolated, then they will not develop cognitive ability, emotional ability. Uh, d- d- physical developmental delays will happen in an infant's life if they are not physically touched. I think that's one of the reasons why God made them so soft and cuddly. You just squeeze them and kiss them and hug them and rub them. You know, because... But here's what you, you probably, some of you probably know failure to thrive syndrome. Some of you probably know that. But what a lot of you don't know is that adults need it too. Okay. UCLA, they did this study a while back that discovered that a, a healthy, fulfilled, satisfied adult needs eight to 10 meaningful touches every day. Eight to 10 meaningful touches, like handshakes, hugs, little squeezes, pat on the backs, like you were made to be affectionate. You were, whether you get married or not, you need that, that touch. Romans 12, uh, verse 10 says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. You got to show it, not just say it. And I challenge, like if some of you, if this is hard for you to receive right now, then you know you need this, okay? You need this. If, if it's hard for you to be physically affectionate, you need to break some things off of you. Like some of you, when I try to hug you, like I'll shake a hand and bring people in. And then, like some of, the, some of you dudes are like, I'll shake your hand and try to bring you in, and you're all, eh. It's such an awkward hug. What's wrong with you? Get in here. Let me love you, man. You need it. I promise you. Let some people love you, all right? And that's what you're going to get at groups, bro. You're going to get some, like, love. You're going to get a hand, firm handshake. You're going to get a hug. You're going to get, I was going to, you're going to get touched in, in, in the right way. Y'all bad, man. Okay, okay. Here's another way. With appreciation. With appreciation. This is how you're going to affirm worth inside of people. We affirm each other's worth with appreciation. You know what appreciation means. Appreciation means to raise in value. So if you ever bought a house, you know, the, you know appreciation. Your, your home is appreciating. If you ever bought a car, you know depreciation. The moment you drove it off the lot, right? It depreciated in value. That's what happened. Every time you appreciate somebody, listen, you raise their value to yourself and others. You raise the value of whatever you appreciate. So when you appreciate your wife, you raise her value. We appreciate your husband. Instead of talking bad about him and what he's not, you're appreciating his value. You're, you're, you're lifting him up instead of tearing him down. When you appreciate your kids, you're raising their value. When you appreciate your small group community, your brothers and your sisters in Christ, you're raising the value. Everything you appreciate increases in value. First Thessalonians chapter 5 says, now brothers and sisters, we ask that you appreciate those who work hard among you, who lead you in the Lord, and who teach you. When's the last time you, you express some appreciation to the people who are serving all around you, who are leading your, your kids, and, and just express, like, like lifted the, the value. In fact, if you lead a team or a group here at Discovery, can you stand up? Come on, just stand up right now if you lead a team or a group here at Discovery. I'm looking at you, not standing. Get you. Come on now, come on now, come on now, come on now. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Give it up for these leaders. Come on, guys. We appreciate you. And for those of you that serve on a team, man, those of you that, 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 you know, whether you're shaking hands, parking cars, serving in kids' ministry, those of you that, like, don't just come and worship a service, but you, like, stay another hour to serve. And, like, thank you so much. Because this, we don't serve, like, 25, 300, 3,000 people a week. It can't happen with just a few. It's got to happen with a lot. And we got over 900 people serving on our team. And, and it makes that, like, without you, it does not happen. So, Thank you for serving. Thank you for leading. And what does that do? Just by me saying that, it just, it just raises the value. You're all, you, there is value, but you got to say it. You don't just think it. you gotta, you got to say it. Whatever you appreciate raises in value. Here's number two. How are we going to encourage and build each other up? By praying for each other's growth. That's how. That's what we're going to do. That's what you're going to have in a small group. You're going to have leaders and people praying for not just your needs, check this out, but for your spiritual maturity, for your development, for your growth. 
That's what this guy was doing in Colossians 4.12. His name is Epaphras. This guy's a hero to me. Look at him. It says, Epaphras, a servant of Jesus Christ from your group. So he was in a group. Isn't that cool? He was in a group. This dude was a hero in the group. He also greets you. He always prays for you that you will grow to be spiritually mature and have everything God wants for you. Like a lot of times we're praying for people's needs, like their physical needs, financial needs, and stuff like that. But when's the last time you prayed for someone's spiritual maturity? When's the last time you prayed for them? Because that's what's going to last, right? Our inner development, our faith and our character, money are come and go, opportunities are going to come and go, our health is going to be up and down, but it's the things inside of us that will last forever. When's the last time? Like in a group, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get people, yes, praying for the needs and things that come throughout your life and seasons, but you're also going to be prayed for your spiritual maturity, Okay. And I think a lot of times we don't pray for spiritual maturity in other people's lives because we don't know like what to pray for. Like, how do I pray for someone's spiritual maturity? Fortunately, there's a lot of verses in the Bible that can help us. If we just speak these verses over people's lives and pray these verses, they're not in your notes, but let me just fly through these verses just to give you, you might want to, if you want to pray for people's spiritual maturity, write some of these down. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19 says, I pray that you'll be able to feel and understand how long, wide, deep, and high Christ's love really is, and to experience this love for yourself. Who do you know in your life that needs God's love right now? That you can just speak and pray this verse over that they would be able to experience the, the immeasurable love, the depth, the width, the breadth of the love of God in their life. You speak this over their life. Hebrews 13 verse 21 is a great one. It says, may God equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Parents, that's a verse for your kids right there. Wouldn't you love to pray that over your kids? Just speak God's word. Ephesians 1.17 says, I keep asking the, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. So who do you know that's facing a, a big decision? Ask God to give them wisdom and revelation that they would see his will uh, through it and, and that he would lead and guide them. You just speak the word of God over their life. How do we encourage and build each other up? Don't just pray for needs. Pray for maturity. Pray for their spiritual development. Pray for them to hear and to know God. That's what you're going to get in groups and that's what we're inviting you, inviting you into. Number three, how do we encourage and build each other up? By admitting her own mistakes. That's how. Man, take off that mask that you, and, and by the way, every one of us are wearing some kind of mask right now because we're all in church, right? You're not, you're not letting it all out. You're not sitting, no, and I wouldn't encourage you to do that. Please, keep it, keep. It's not wise for you to be like, we're not just going to be like, all right, who's first? You know, that's not cool. That's not wise. But, but you need a place where you can be real, where you can be authentically you. And by admitting our own mistakes, we build community, Intimacy, relationships faster than any other way by doing this. Ephesians 4.25 says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are all members of one body. Tell the truth about yourself, your fears, your doubts, your hangups. Confession, it doesn't just mean confessing your deep, dark sins. You know what I mean? You don't just confess all the deep, dark, okay, here's my hidden thing. I've never told anybody. That's not all it means here. Confession simply is just like being real with what's, like I'm having doubts today, man. That's being honest. That's a confession. Like, uh, you know what? I'm worried about such and such. That's a confession. You know, I'm feeling lonely today. That's a confession. I'm having a hard time forgiving this person that did. That is, that's a confession. You're being honest. You know what, today I feel a little, I'm feeling discouraged. I feel a little depressed. That's what it means to have confession. When you're honest about what's going on in your life and you're not blaming everybody else for it, it draws people closer to you and you to them. And honestly, that's, that's a power, one of the most powerful things in our groups that happen. An authentic community that happens is, is the, the healing that comes from being honest about your mistakes. There's so many stories that, that we have heard over the years about what God has done through authentic community, but we have one for you to view. Check this out. You know, it's amazing. You're in a room full of people, you're still alone. And I think that's, you know, there's probably a lot of people do that. You come in and you, you've got everybody around you, you're crowded but you're still sitting in the seat all by yourself. And then once you get to know people, then you have interactions, and it's just it's so much better. 
you know, seeing the guys in your group and their families that you get to know. And all of a sudden you become part of a family instead of sitting by yourself. Actually, I'd been in church most of my life. Um, actually, was on staff and uh, serving at a church, but, uh, you know, after years of doing that, being in that situation, it just kind of didn't work out as well as I thought it would. I, after about 30 some odd years, at 60 years old, I woke up and I had a failed marriage and a uh, strained relationship with my children. And I got to the point where I was like, well, I'm not going to church if I can't go without my family. So I didn't. And then I decided one day, I'll give Discovery a try. And I came in and it was great. But the thing I thought is, you know, it's big, so I can hide here. And that was my thought. I can go in, enjoy the worship, enjoy the uh, message, and then hit the door and no one will know. Not really accountable. So that's basically what I did. I showed up every Sunday and hit the door, made a right turn, made another right turn down the street where I parked away from the parking lot, get my car and go. But over time, I ran into this guy every Sunday almost, going towards the parking lot when I was leaving. And it first started out with just nods and waves and, hey, how are you, and good. And then it got to be handshakes, and short conversations, things like that. And so I got to know him. He was genuine. He was real, and I liked that. So it made me think, maybe I need to get to know more people at Discovery. So that's what I did. I joined a 7 a.m. small group with men, and there were some great guys in it. And uh, we studied the Bible and debated and had um, developed an, a, an unbelievable trusting relationship there where I felt safe. God touched me at that time. He goes, you need to tell them, just open up and tell them everything. And I did. And that was, and we had a moment afterwards where they responded to me in an unbelievable way. But I think when you make yourself open and vulnerable, then other people feel like they can be too. And that was the big day right there is when I was just able, and it just hit me, you know, you need to, you need to tell them. You need to open up. That's like a ton off your shoulders. It's like the weight of the world is gone. And I think that's just God letting you know that there's people here to carry the weight with you. That was the big thing. And, they, and like you said, you, you don't look up and no one's judging. Everyone's like, let me help. Let me help. And that's, just, like I said, it's a weight lifted. So I stayed in the group and after a while they're like, you know what, you need to be, you need to be leading the group. And I was like, no, I'm too old and I've done too much. You know, I've, nobody wants to hear that. And then one Sunday, Pastor Jason was in Moses talking about your identity and not letting your past affect your identity. And it hit me. And as I was leaving, I ran into the same guy that I always did. And he you know, I said, you know what I got out of the message today? I'm not too old. And that's when I decided to start leading a group. I remember a quote from Ruth Graham that said, in every seat there's a broken heart. And I think that's what small groups are for. You can go to a small group and that's where you heal your broken heart. And that's what happened with me, just getting involved with some men. First of all, with one man. And then with a small group, just opening it up and then getting bigger and then leading my own group. It was just an amazing way for me to move, take my heart and let small groups fix it. And that's what happens in small groups. You develop that relationship with people and that love of Christ and the Holy Spirit helps mend all their brokenness. So that to me is what small groups are all about. I think most people are afraid is why they don't join small groups because they don't want people to probably know them. But here people are so loving and so non-judgmental that they'll love you, whoever you are. They aren't going to judge you on your past. They're going to love you no matter what. And I think that's one of the things that's best taught here is um, just come, belong, and then you can become later. <laughs> you know, I love that. Amen. What a powerful story. I think there's a, there's a lot of people, similar to James, who are just kind of existing in the crowd and the multitudes. Um, but never really connected. And maybe it is fear for really being known, but if you, James' story could be your story. If you really just admit, you get connected and you open up. It doesn't happen right away. It takes, it takes maybe, oftentimes it's like week three, four, five, or six. It's in that window that if you just build a relationship enough that you can really test some things and start being honest about what's going on. And, 
And that can, that can happen in your life. It's scary, I know, even thinking about like, man, talking about real stuff, yeah. But here's what you're missing out on. Let me show you what you're missing out on. When you, by admitting your own mistakes, here's what's going to happen. Number one, you get emotional healing. Healing happens when you actually admit your own mistakes. From being honest, James 5 and 16 is this amazing principle. He says, therefore, confess your sins to who? To each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. See, there's a big difference between forgiveness and healing. When you need forgiveness, you go to God. You don't need to go to me. You don't need to go to a priest. You don't need to go to any person. You just, if, when you confess to God, you are healed, okay? You, are, you get forgiveness, I mean, immediately. But God says that you are healed when you confess to another person. See, some of you have confessed to God and you've been forgiven, yet you still can't let it go. It has a hold on your heart. You're, you feel the weight of your guilt and your shame. And what's holding back the floodgates of freedom in your life is not that you haven't talked to God about it. He, he, you did tell him. By the way, he already knew. It's, it's actually talking to someone else and getting honest about it that actually brings healing into our life. Remember, God designed us this way. He created you for this community, not just physically that you would need touch, but even emotionally that you would need this healing through the relationships, the right kind of relationships in your, in your life. Not only emotional healing, but we also get this when we admit our mistakes. We get a fresh start. And some of you are here today and you need a fresh start. You might think that you've made a mess of it. Listen to me, the devil would love for you to continue to cover it up, for you to act like it's not there, for you to continue to try to do it yourself and haunt you forever with your mistakes and your past. He would love for you to stay in the darkness. Proverbs 28 says this, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. This is why I love Celebrate Recovery at our church so much. It's, it's a ministry, a group here at Discovery that whatever your hurts and habits and hangups are, you can get around other people that have the same issues, the same struggles, and not only get accountability, but have a place where you can be honest where you can be real about what's going on in your life. You can get it off your chest. And the cool thing about this, what we've seen over and over again, is that area where you have that wound or that hurt or that habit or that hang up, when you get it off your chest, very often God uses that same hurt that you had, the same habit you had, or the hang up you had to actually help someone else in the same issue. Some of you need a fresh start today. And, that's, and you can't get it. You cannot get it unless you admit that you need it, that you made some mistakes. Now, when you do that as well, when you admit you made some mistakes, here's, here's the last thing you get. God promises to help you. God promises to help you. Uh, you know, you can continue to try to do it yourself. Fix it yourself. Do it yourself. But when you finally admit, I, don't, I, don't, I can't do it, God, you invite the power of God into your life. James 4.10 says, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. It's, look, God doesn't want to kick you down. He doesn't, he doesn't want you down. Like, in fact, you think like by confessing it and, and, and bringing it out in the open that that somehow is going to bring you low. That is a lie of the enemy. The very thing that's holding you down is that darkness, is that secret, is you holding it. It's pushing you down. The only way for you to be lifted up is to be free of it, is to confess it, is to admit it. And when you do, when you humble yourself, God says, now I can lift you up. Now I can, I can raise you up. Okay, lastly, number four, you guys. The way we can build each other up is by encouraging each other's commitment. We encourage each other's commitment. Now, commitment's important. Commitment to what? Commitment to this life of, that God has called us to, a life of a calling, a purpose. Commitment to community, to just to, to doing life together. Here's why this is so important, you guys, because your life is shaped by whatever you're committed to. You, you show me what your commitments are, and I'll tell you where you're going to end up in your life. Whatever you're committed to, that, those commitments that you're making are shaping your life. Romans 1.12 tells us, I want us to help each other with the faith that we have. Your faith will help me, and my faith will help you. That's why you need a church family. Hey, this is why you need a small group, you guys. This is why you need the right friends in your life, friends that are going to build you up. 
instead of pull you down. Friends that are going to come alongside you on this journey of faith that God has called us on. That in fact, like, like it doesn't happen and you can't. It does not work just by you consuming more content, getting more sermons, reading more books. You actually need to step into authentic community, develop enough vulnerability and safety with people to be honest about yourself. And when you do that, I'm telling you, God's going to lift you up. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.